Hi, I'm Agent Ford. Do you think you can help me solve another true crime mystery? Living in a trailer park and working as a part-time bartender, the 32-year-old Scott Bernard Amador didn't live too quiet a life. But the life he did live was vibrant and youthful, according to his friends and family. Born January 26, 1963, he would regularly frequent the Flamingo Bar, a Pontiac gay bar where he worked. Despite being beloved by many around him, he also had a drug problem, was charged with assault three times, was heavily in debt following four years of army service, and was employed save for the shifts given to him at the Flamingo. Nonetheless, he didn't get into any big confrontations and tried to live a life that made him comfortable. Throughout the 90s, it was familiar and expected for a celebrity to kickstart their own talk shows, hosting bizarre or famous guests from all walks of life to capitalize on consumer and audience outrage and amazement. One such celebrity was the comedian Jenny Jones, who ran the Jenny Jones Show for eight years between 1993 and 2001. In 1995, while filming their third annual season of the show, they ran an advert for people to appear on a segment dedicated to confessing your local crush on recorded TV. This particular segment was called Same Sex Secret Crushes. Scott Amador jumped at the opportunity for a bit of money, of course, but also had his eyes on a guy lately. 25-year-old Jonathan Schmitz. Jonathan Schmitz had a history of suicidal thoughts and mental instability. Still, he managed his time working at a premium and posh restaurant in Bloomfield Hills called the Fox and Hounds. Some of his friends suspected he might be gay, even occasionally attending the same establishment where Scott worked, the Flamingo. However, he profusely denied these claims and maintained his heterosexuality, even briefly getting engaged to a woman at one point. Scott couldn't get Schmitz out of his head having met him recently in the parking lot of an apartment building owned by their mutual friend. He immediately became infatuated and smitten and decided to exclaim his love on television for profit and romance. And so, on March 6, 1995, Scott showed up on the set of The Jenny Jones Show to be taped confessing to Schmitz, who had been told he had a secret admirer and to appear on the show. The unassuming Jonathan Schmitz thought it might be his ex-girlfriend and later claims he had been told the admirer would be a woman. The Jenny Jones show disputes this, stating they implied the admirer could be of any sexual orientation. However, we cannot know for sure. Schmitz waited off screen while Scott discussed what he'd like to do with the other man. He described his fantasies of wanting to tie him to his hammock, use whipped cream and strawberries, and go on dates. He said he liked Schmitz's hard little body. After talking like this for a while, Schmitz was brought on stage to meet his secret admirer, and he was shocked to discover it was a man. They awkwardly hugged. Scott's feelings were laid bare, and Schmitz replied, claiming he was completely heterosexual but flattered while laughing amiably. Allegedly, as stated by a friend of Scott's and confirmed during the murder trial, the two went out drinking that night with their mutual friend. Their secret date apparently developed into... A sexual encounter. There's also speculation that alcoholic drinks were served to guests on the Jenny Jones show, but the producers denied this. Nonetheless, that night Scott rang his mother delighted by the recent events, and Schmitz returned home deeply troubled and upset. On the 8th, he slept on his friend's couch and returned home that morning to discover Scott had left a present on his doorstep. A construction sign with a blinking light attached and a little note. The note read, if you want to turn this off, you have to use your tool. Schmitz entered his car and drove to a shop called Gary's Guns, spending $250 on a 12-gauge shotgun. He ensured the seller he was going hunting before leaving for Tom's Hardware to purchase five buckshot rounds. At 11 a.m., he pulled into Scott's house and knocked on the door. He asked whether Scott had left the construction sign on his doorstep, to which Scott flirtatiously confirmed it was him. Schmitz nodded and said he wanted to get something for Scott, returned to his car, retrieved the shotgun, and walked back to the house. Scott, terrified and panicking, held a wicker chair in front of himself for defense. Jonathan Schmitz fired two loads into Scott Amateur's chest, 
killing him instantly, and walked to a phone box. Fifteen minutes after the murder, Jonathan Schmitz rang 911 saying, He screwed me on national TV. I just walked into his house and killed him. He was after me day and night. Case is a harrowing, upsetting, and incredibly public one. It sent ripples through America when it happened, particularly for the celebrity and televised involvement of the affair and the gay panic defense employed by Schmidt's defense attorney. Nonetheless, we don't know for absolute certain what was going through either of their heads nor the exact circumstances leading to the act. According to Karen Campbell, executive producer of The Jenny Jones Show, Schmidt had phoned in the day after taping to confirm a love connection match between him and Scott. There's a lot of speculation surrounding the show's handling of the event regardless. From the alleged alcohol consumption, the way Schmidt claims he was coerced into appearing on the show, and the lack of background checks on those involved, to the way Jones kept twisting the knife by suggesting Scott should present Schmidt with flowers and kiss him on camera. It was all for views and money with little concern for those involved. Schmidt's legal team argued that the potential embarrassment he faced and his mental health along with Scott's advances made him snap. They claimed that due to being manically depressed and having Graves' disease, he was forced to commit homicide following humiliation. They argued that the show had not sufficiently checked his background, had not provided any counseling, and ignored Schmidt's, saying he didn't want his secret admirer to be a man. Allegedly, the former producer, Ron Muccianti, had repeatedly told Schmitz he had seen the girl of his dreams to trick him into appearing on the show. They later employed the gay panic defense, insinuating Scott's advances had sent Schmitz into a downward spiral. This is a traditional technique where the defendant claims a loss of control due to their victim's sexual orientation and is widely contended for its bigoted undertones. Prosecutors argued premeditated murder, as evident by the purchasing of equipment that morning, and that Schmitz had turned violent, proven by the upturned wicker chair. They also claimed the Jenny Jones show to hold no responsibility, as his demeanor on the show and pre-interviews suggested no suspicion for murder or homophobia. Additionally, Schmitz claimed the inciting reason for the murder to be his suspicion of being stalked, not his experience on the show. Though this falls contrary to other evidence stated throughout this video and the trial in question. In 1996, Schmitz was found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to 20 to 50 years in prison. However, his conviction was overturned by mass appeal and he was given a retrial, after which he was once again declared guilty of the same charge. The first degree suggests premeditated murder, whereas the second degree insinuates a deliberate but not premeditated killing. It is widely believed that the large amount of media coverage given to the case lowered the charge from first degree to second degree murder, and this is a point of contention among many critics, particularly of the LGBTQ community. At the sentencing, Schmitz took the opportunity to apologize to the Amador family, saying, I can't take any of this back. I want to thank all my family and friends who have stood by me. Nonetheless, Scott's mother, Patricia Graves, urged the judge to be as stern as possible. She claimed Schmitz had murdered her son in cold blood and would still be a relatively young man upon release, whereas Scott will never age. The jury compensated Scott Amador's family with $6.5 million in funeral and burial expenses, $5 million for pain and suffering, and $10 million for loss of companionship and compensation. One of the nine jurors favored the defendant's argument, making it a non-unanimous decision, however. They only just won this compensation, as eight jurors were required for the verdict. They later sued the Jenny Jones show for wrongful death, but it was overturned surprisingly and controversially. They had been awarded $29,332,686 in damages before the overturning. The Michigan Supreme Court ultimately declined to hear the case. Despite them not winning money for damages, the court case saw changes in how reality TV shows admit guests, including the implementation of more stringent psychological profiling. On August 22, 2017, Schmitz was released from prison on good behavior after a 22-year sentence. He is now 51 years old and a free man. However, his identity and whereabouts have been kept a secret. 
All we know is that he keeps a low profile and lives in Michigan. Scott Amador's brother, Frank Jr., was not happy about the circumstances of his release, saying, I wanted assurance that the decision was not based on just good behavior in prison. I'd like to know Schmitz learned something, that he's a changed man, he's no longer homophobic, and has gotten psychological care. This particular episode of The Jenny Jones Show was never broadcasted, thankfully, but this isn't the first and won't be the last time a reality TV show has led to murder or suicide. The Jerry Springer Show, The Jeremy Kyle Show, To Catch a Predator, Megan Wants a Millionaire, and more. When we parade people around like characters and treat their feelings and emotions like toys or instruments, we can sometimes get horrible and dramatically disastrous conclusions. There is no doubt in my mind that Scott Amador's murder was premeditated and had internally homophobic undertones. However, I'm just as certain that recording a mentally unwell man who was unaware of the producer's true intent for the audience's surprise and appeal contributed to the quick and horrible events that followed. That is it for this case. Don't forget to let me know what you think about this case in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button and share it with your fellow investigators. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Hit that notification bell so you never miss a case. With that being said, stay safe, and I'll see you guys at the next crime scene.